So good morning everyone and welcome to our 10.30 service online and in the building. So it's great to have you here with us. If you're new to St Andrews, a very, very warm welcome. My name's Abby and I'm uh, the children and youth pastor here at St Andrews. So this week, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've been struggling quite a lot, um, if I'm honest. The past couple of weeks have felt so hard. Lockdown has felt so much different and we're nearly a year in. Um, and I just wanted to share with you all that this morning I was praying for church and praying about why is it so hard? How, what can we do to make it better? And actually, God didn't give me anything to make it better. God actually reminded me of all the amazing things that are going on at home. And even though it feels tougher this time, what I found beautiful this morning is realizing how connected we all are over social media um, and seeing those good newses and seeing uh, different people's plans and like on a, every morning pretty much I see Steph Norden's post and asking us how we are, what our week's going to be like. Um, I see other people putting some beautiful words, quotes, pictures, signs, different things that actually we didn't really do much of before. So I just want to say to you guys, this, these past few, few weeks, if you're feeling like it's getting just a bit too tough and it's getting really hard, I just want you to remember that you can connect with others and you can still be in relation at home and not in person. And I'm just really, really thankful for all the people that spread that love, spread that joy, ask how each other are. Um, and we're just going to pray about that now. So Father God, we just, we know that it's getting harder and we'll give all that to you, Lord. We know that the world is looking different, but we thank you for all the amazing things that are happening, for all the inspirational things that are happening, for all the groups that we can be a part of, Lord. And I just pray that you can remind us of all the good things that are happening right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So just a few notices as we start. Alpha starts this Tuesday at 7.45. So please do invite people to that. And just a reminder that we do have a Youth Alpha every Sunday at 6 p.m. So if you know someone who is in year six and above, please invite them along to that and message me for the Zoom code. That would be amazing. So today is the first Sunday of Lent and we meet in the name of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. God is one. So it's time where we confess our sins. So Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the garden and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. So let us confess our sins, remembering before God the times when we have fallen from temptation into sin. So God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us for all that is past and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. So almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So now we're going to worship with the song Waymaker. And Father, we just thank you that you are our Waymaker. You are our promise keeper. You deliver everything that you have promised, Lord. And we thank you for that. So let's stand and worship together.
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Hello. Um, today our Bible reading is taken from the parable of the Good Samaritan, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He bent down and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Well, good morning, church. Good morning to those in the building and those at home. So this morning, we continue our sermon series on the theme of who was Jesus? And today we look at Jesus, the radical. So to begin with, we might ask, what do we mean by radical? And secondly then, why was Jesus radical? Why was it that people who he met and talked to found what he was saying and his ideas so radical? Now, today the term radical and radicalism has got a bad press. It's a word whose meaning has changed and evolved but it's still a useful concept. Today we think of someone who is radical in relation to someone who has become radicalized, usually referring to them adopting an extreme system of beliefs, extreme beliefs that are associated in the common mind with terrorism. And so we hear of government programs to prevent radicalization, particularly among young people, and interventions to prevent violent extremism. But being radical really means something else. It means someone who is embarked upon pursuing thorough and complete political or social change, or in Jesus' case, complete religious, spiritual, and societal change. And of course, thanks to Michelangelo, the teenage mutant ninja turtle, not the artist, it also now means something that's really cool impressive or awesome. Jesus was a radical dude in both senses, being set on change and being awesome. What Jesus was saying, and we have a great example in our reading today from Luke's Gospel, was truly radical. For those listening, it would have turned their thinking upside down. Now, when someone does that to us, it can be challenging, difficult, and uncomfortable. New difficult thinking, thinking that is different from what we're used to, can be hard to accept. It can also be fascinating and exciting. Now, for those of us who have been Christians a long time, or who have grown up in Christian households, or maybe gone to 
a school where Christianity was taught, it can be difficult to fully appreciate the magnitude of the difference in thinking about the world that Jesus was introducing. Even for someone who is watching now, who has just t tuned in to a service, maybe someone from another country, the likelihood is that they will have heard of Jesus and have some idea of what he advocated. Love your neighbor, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. Now, they might not recognize those ideas as something that Jesus taught or call them Christian. But many people will have come across those ideas before somewhere and have an idea maybe only a vague idea that some people try to live by them. But what if you really had no idea? What if this was genuinely new? Now, does anyone remember a TV program called Tribe? Well, it was on the BBC between 2005 and 2007, and yes, I did have to look that up because it's longer ago than I thought. And it ran over three series, and it was presented by an explorer, an ex-Royal Marine called Bruce Parry. And he visited remote tribes all over the world and spent a month with each. He immersed himself in their society, he embraced their methods and practices. He took part in initiation rites and rituals, including spiritual rituals, that are a world away from what we practice here in Radcliffe. I love that series. Here were people who lived lives that were so different to yours and mine. They were as different as you can possibly imagine. And for many of those tribal peoples, the idea that there was only one God would be radical, let alone a God who became incarnate, who became man, in order to show people a new way of relating to one another and to them and to himself. Now, I'm laboring that point because the story of the Good Samaritan has become so familiar to many of us that we can overlook just how radical it is. And thus we can overlook how challenging but also how exciting the message is. And how challenging and exciting Jesus is. How radical, how awesome. Now, we're told that Jesus was talking to a Jewish lawyer, someone for whom the idea that you helped others and loved your neighbors was, was not new, but what was new was the idea of who that should be applied to. That it applies to everyone beyond your tribe. Luke tells us that the expert in the law stood up to test Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Don't you hate it when someone answers a question with a question? Jesus does, and so he invites the lawyer to participate actively in exploring the answers of, to his own questions. What is written in the law, he asks. The expert answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And then the expert goes on to ask another question, and who is my neighbor? This time, Jesus responds with a parable, a story about a Samaritan who rescues a traveler. And as is typical of Jesus' parables, this one disorientates and subverts conventional views. The traveler's on his way to Jericho, is attacked, stripped of his clothes, beaten and left for dead. A priest comes along and passes by on the other side of the road. A Levite also passes by on the other side. But then a Samaritan comes along, stops to help, Bandages, bandages his wounds, cleans him up, puts him on his own donkey, and takes him to an inn. He then pays for the innkeeper to look after him for as long as it takes for the traveler to recover. And all this for someone he doesn't know, and who in all probability was a Jew. Now both the Levite and the priest, religious leaders, were charged by their faith with loving their neighbor. The expert in the law knew that, and he quoted the book of Leviticus, but they fail. In order to grasp the full importance of the story, we need to understand the times and concerns of first century Judea, where Jesus and his followers lived. To do this, we need to understand something of the relationship between Jews and Samaritans. For Jesus' audience, a Samaritan was the most despised outcast they could imagine. 
It's not just that they were from another tribe, it's that they were from the most hated tribe imaginable. It's hard to come up with a modern equivalent, but try and think of the kind of person that would make your stomach turn and your skin crawl. This is the last person on earth you would imagine Jesus to endorse. So who were the Samaritans really? They were not simply outcasts. They were despised enemies of the Jews. Yet where listeners were expected uh, to have heard about a Jew who was to be the hero of Jesus' story, instead they'd be really shocked to hear that it was a Samaritan. They were ethnically and religiously different. They were descended from intermarriage between Israelites and foreigners. So Samaritans were only part Jewish, and the religious differences were significant. The Samaritans only regarded the five books of the Torah as scripture. They had their own version of the texts. And in violation of Deuteronomy 12, which says that they should on, you should only worship in one place, which says the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes, they worship God in their own temple at Mount Gerizim, rather than the temple in Jerusalem. They were ethnic and religious enemies of the Jews, and they fought the Jews had destroyed the Samaritan temple. So the, the hero in the story is this despised Samaritan. And not only that, but the person in the story who is the one that everything happens to, the one who's robbed and beaten and left for dead, would be regarded by those listening as a bit of an idiot who didn't deserve saving. Jesus tells this story as a man who is traveling from Jerusalem to, Re to Jericho, and it's the only story that he tells with a specific geographic location. Why? Because the road to Jericho was notoriously unsafe. It descended steeply from the heights of Jerusalem via switchback curves that made it an ideal place for an ambush. In other words, Jesus' audience would have had no sympathy for a man who was beaten, stripped, and robbed, and left for dead. He was a fool to have traveled that road on his own. He got what he was coming to him. So we have two characters in the story. A traveler who takes a stupid risk traveling alone in a dangerous place and a Samaritan, a despised outsider who stops to help him. Now when Jesus turns the question around asking the lawyer who was the neighbor to the robber's victim, the lawyer is so embarrassed that he can't even bring himself to say Samaritan. So instead, the lawyer responds, the one who treated him with mercy. Now with this story, Jesus is issuing a radical challenge to those who are listening. There are no non-neighbors. There is no one you can write off as, an, as other, or an outsider, or an outcast, and he shatters the illusion that keeps us from seeing that we belong to one another. And what of our traveler victim, the robber's victim? Jesus knows that those who are hearing it would have contempt for him. And the story then seeks to replace that judgment with compassion, just as the Samaritan replaced judgment with compassion and stopped and helped. Making the Samaritan the hero and having compassion for the foolish traveler is radical. It turns on its head two conventional perceptions amongst ancient Jews. The first is that the belief that, or their belief, that eternal life is the exclusive, exclusive privilege of their own religious or ethnic community. It's not. It goes much wider than that. In this story, the one who inherits eternal life because of the love for the needy man is the religious ethnic outsider and the enemy. Jesus makes clear that eternal life is tied not only to Torah obedience, but also to showing mercy to strangers in desperate need. Most of the actual parable itemizes lots of ways the Samaritan helps the injured man. And for the Jewish expert in the law and other listeners to hear that, the priest and the Levite would not inherit eternal life because of their failure to love the man in need would have been really disturbing. And the parable also threatens a second ancient Jewish perception. Referring to the Samaritan, Jesus tells the lawyer, go and do likewise. 
Jesus presents the Samaritan not as someone to pity or even to love, but as, as a person to imitate. This ethnic and religious enemy is not only the story's hero, he's also the moral example to follow. And so the parable offers us a new radical vision of life. It insists that enemies can prove to be neighbors, that compassion is to have no boundaries, and that judging people on the basis of their religion, ethnicity, or even the seemingly stupid nature of their actions will actually leave us all dying in the ditch. Now, we're not told by Luke, and the story doesn't appear in the other Gospels, how the lawyer reacts or how the others who were there responded. Some will have been horrified, but I like to think that others will have been excited. Here was someone who thought like no other person. Here was someone who was truly radical, truly awesome, someone worth following, someone who would change the world. Jesus, the radical, liked telling stories. It was his preferred method of teaching about God and humanity. There are almost 40 parables in the Gospels, and almost one-third of Jesus' teaching in Luke is from them. The stories, yes, they teach moral lessons, but they're much more than this. Jesus, the radical's parables disturb, challenge, and disorientate the hearers, and now us as readers, turning conventional views on their head. And they show us just how awesome Jesus was and is. So I hope that by exploring this story together, we can see afresh and fully appreciate the magnitude of the difference in thinking about the world that Jesus was introducing. I hope it rekindles some of the challenge as well as some of the excitement that you felt when hearing about Jesus for the first time. If you want others to experience that excitement, to see the world through fresh eyes, then do tell them. And what better way than to invite them to our Alpha course that starts on Tuesday night. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for your teaching. Thank you for your stories, your parables. parables. Thank you for Luke who wrote them down so that future generations, including us, could discover and learn. Thank you for showing us new ways to think and to be. Thank you for being a radical and inviting us to follow you. Thank you for setting our hearts on fire with excitement for where that journey may take us as we go and do likewise. Amen. We're going to worship now. Our song is How Deep the Father's Love.
Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this week. This week just passed and we thank you for the week to come. We thank you Lord for being with us and we ask for your help and guidance as we enter a new week. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for the world and for its needs especially during this time of the pandemic. Lord, give us wisdom and generosity to ensure that all those who need the many different vaccines will get them. Father, where there is fighting, bring your peace and turn people's hearts from hatred to love and to yourself. Be with all those who are hungry, not just in the world, but also in this country and bless those who are bringing relief at this time of trial. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for the church and her life. Help the church to continue to thrive. For those churches that are suffering, we pray for your blessings to be poured out upon them. Bless and guide those in leadership. Give them wisdom, we pray. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let's pray for those who are suffering because of illness. And in this coming time of quiet, let's just mention out loud or just in our own hearts, those we know who need God's touch at this time. Lord, also help us to remember those who are ill but are not being treated because Covid has taken up all the resources. Help us Lord never to forget those who are suffering because they have lost loved ones. Those who are suffering because of the strain of the pandemic. Those who are suffering through loneliness and the daily stress of life. Enable each one of us to be your loving hands, ministering in their time of need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And we pray, Lord God, for those who are working, for those that are working in their workplace, keep them safe, we pray. Protect them and bless them in all that they do. We ask for your blessings upon those who are working at home and we pray that their homes will be full of a place of peace, especially for those who have children homeschooling. Help the children and young people as they continue their educational journey in such an uncertain world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are on furlough for those who have faced redundancy, who have an uncertain future, be close to them at this time. May their basic needs be met and help us to reach out to those around us to offer support for each other. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Trusting in the compassion of God, 
as our Saviour taught us, let us pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, and your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Oh, thank you so much, Mike and Deb. They were lovely. So we've come to the time where it's our notices and birthdays. So I don't know if you remember, but Joe challenged us to pray for one or two people. So we're going to continue to pray for them. But this week, Alpha starts on Tuesday. So we're going to pray and we're going to invite them to Alpha. So we're still going to pray for them, but we're going to physically ask them to join us at Alpha. So please do invite anyone you can think of. And it starts on Tuesday at 7.45. And just a quick reminder again, Youth Alpha, if you know anyone year six upwards, please do invite them to join us along in Youth Alpha starting tonight again. So birthdays. This week we've had Roy Bladen and Joyce Foster. I've got it on my hand here. Sorry, guys. One rubbed out on the inside. And then we've had Michael Brown's birthday. Happy birthday. And Matt Laycock's 80th that is awesome. And do you know, we took so much joy from the picture that we've seen of Matt holding his birthday balloon. What an absolute blessing. So I hope you guys have had a beautiful, beautiful birthday. And next Sunday, it is Carol Barlow's birthday. And she is going to be a massive 68. Can you believe that? Because I definitely can't. Happy birthday for next Sunday, Carol. <laughs> So now it's the time where we think about giving and we're thinking about, we can give in so many ways, but we're thinking about how we can financially give. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name that you are both our provider and our provision. You give us all that we need for both our physical and our spiritual needs. And you yourself are that provision for you are the life and the light, the health and the wholeness. So help us to know, Lord, that everything we have is yours. So as we let your spirit guide us in this act of worship, help us to be cheerful givers. Amen. And there's a few ways that you can give. You can give by a standing order. You can give by envelopes. I love this. Joe has this ready. Like just some cash and an envelope. That's another way that you can give. And you can also donate to an easy funding fundraising page easy fundraising fundraising page on facebook so it's just as simple as clicking on donating how much money you want and that's it so we just pray and thank god for his provision of finance so almighty god keep our hearts ever thankful for your gracious provision for your church here in radcliffe and may we grow in grace and come to know you as our provider, spiritually, financially and physically, more and more in the days that lie ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now we're going to have our offertory song, which is Love Divine. <laughs>
ability to deliver Let us all thy life receive Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave Thee we would be always blessing give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us and those whom we love and pray for now and always. Amen. So let us bless the Lord and thanks be to God. Blessing, honour and glory be yours here and everywhere now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. 